Thank you, Matthew and Kia ora. My name is Tim Derrick, uh, member of Cohort 4 and uh, Kohia. My mountains are the Adirondack Mountains. My river is the Osable, and my waka is a cedar strip canoe pictured here. My father, pictured here at uh, age 86, uh, a couple months before he died. And my tribe is, is here, uh, and they're in the back. So when uh, I was a boy, my father explained to me, had to explain to me that the fish in our mountain lakes, in the Adirondacks, in our rivers, were dying. And he went on to say further that the reason for the, uh, really, the, the, the degradation of our, our mountain uh, environment, our lakes, our rivers, ultimately our flora and fauna as well, was caused by coal plants 500 miles away in the United States' most prolific coal producing and, and generating area, the Ohio River Valley. So uh, what happened is at the time, as you may know, acid rain, uh, sulfur dioxide, nitrous oxide, all kinds of things are picked up and travel with the winds and fall in a mountainous area. As an eight-year-old, this inspired or instilled in me principles which have inspired me, I think, my, my whole life. And I have spent now 18 years in renewable energy, uh, primarily in uh, wind and solar development from large companies like Enron and General Electric and Sun Edison to small startups and ultimately my own company. Um, and it's been, uh, it's, a, it's been a journey. And I wanted to share in, in five minutes or less just a couple nuggets out of this journey that may be uh, hopefully are, are, are surprising or new information. And I wanted to close with a bit of a vision for uh, New Zealand with regard to, uh, with regard to renewable energy. Um, maybe I'll start just briefly with the why. I guess this is the, the Al Gore portion of my speech. Why, why electricity generation? Why is it important in this effort? It's very simple if you just look at the numbers. Today, it's the largest single contributor to greenhouse gases. There are many others, but it's a big lever that we can pull as a society around greenhouse gases, about 25%. Um, and then we look also at the where. And uh, clearly, those of us in developed uh, countries bear the lion's share of responsibility for this. And uh, so this has been a call to action for me. And while we're on this slide, I want to call out uh, the, the leading position that New Zealand really uh, fills in the, in the developed world in terms of the, some of the lowest levels of greenhouse gas emissions. So. Uh, I'll come back to this later. Uh, yeah, it still looks like too much. <laughs> what I, before I jump into, I just want to explain a little bit of this amazing journey in 18 years around cost. And I, I, what I, so I'd like to leave with you is just some data from the front lines of solar and, and wind energy, particularly where I have worked. And the, the plunging costs of, uh, of both wind and solar are quite remarkable. Um, when I started in wind at Enron in 2001, if you just fast forward 18 years, we're about 10x lower. So divide by 10 the cost or the price. The story in solar is even more remarkable. And uh, in, from a start in 2005 in solar to today, that cost reduction has been about 15x. And that's, that's remarkable. Um, I, this is uh, for all the, the data uh, for energy geeks, and this is something that we follow, and we, we, not to be outdone by Moore's Law, which governs the cost of semiconductors, there is a law we follow in solar called Swanson's Law, and effectively that the cost uh, reduces by 20% with every doubling of, um, of the manufacturing volume, and that is very true, as, as you can see from this um, logarithmic, this is a logarithmic uh, scale, so it, it's actually more dramatic. Um, and uh, it, it's constantly moving, and the good news is we're, we're, we're still um, running below, uh, below the curve. Great news, solar is in the range uh, anywhere around uh, $40, $40 a megawatt hour, and I think this slide, this is the, this is the curve, not in, not in logarithmic version. 
And um, what's important to understand, I think, is how this compares to other fossil fuels. And this is a lot of data, hard to read, but if you're going to take away one thing, it is that wind and solar at utility scale can compete today with uh, the most efficient gas turbines and can it ultimately is cheaper than coal, uh, gas in its different forms, particularly gas peaker, geothermal, and others. And that's, that's a message uh, that the data has changed so quickly, the, the market has changed so quickly that most people don't know that. And it's dependent on your location. But it is, it, is, uh, it is the reality. This is a pretty conservative outfit, by the way, Lazard, that consults to utilities that provides this data. So it's not, uh, this is real. And in fact, it's even, if it's six months old, it's already changed. So that's a great, great story. I learned a, a great word from our Maori brother, Tamaho. Uh, and I, uh, as I learned, Maori ka mutu pia. I hope I'm saying that right. We've done a lot of good work but there's a lot more to do. And so as I look at where I spend the next 18 years, um, I, I would say that, uh, and a, a speaker brought this up yesterday, the heavy lifting has been done in terms of driving the cost down. The large companies have entered. Uh, my last company, a large chunk, was acquired by British Petroleum. That's part of the reason why I'm here. I feel like that is in the hands of now the incumbent energy companies. And now, Kamutopia, there is additional work to do. And uh, uh, in the short remaining time, I'll just kind of highlight some of the exciting places where we're working now. Energy storage, tremendous innovation at all levels, tremendous need if we are to drive further penetration of an intermittent renewable resource on the grid. Um, grid edge is a broad topic that refers from everything from efficiency to demand response to distributed solar. Lots of great work going on at the level we say the edges of the grid. This one I can't even begin to address in our time. Energy access, 1.2 billion people in our world do not have access to electricity. That's 16%. That's electricity for lighting, for learning, for refrigeration of medicine, for health and safety, 1.2 billion. Transportation, electrification of transportation happening more quickly than we think. I've enjoyed greatly some conversations, at least among my cohort with uh, thought leaders on the blockchain side. How do we reinvent the utility business model? How do we trade electricity peer to peer as opposed to through a central resource? But I'll leave you uh, with just a vision. And I know it's, it's not particularly, uh, it's not bold, it's, it's out there already. New Zealand has committed to 100% renewables by 2035. There are some naysayers, uh, and the incumbents in the, our space, there are, will always be naysayers. It is very possible, and, and in fact, um, some industry suggests, or data points suggest, it can happen faster. It has happened faster in California. I think we have hit every goal ahead of schedule, and I would expect that to happen in New Zealand. Uh, what makes New Zealand <laughs> unique is the fact of the tremendous natural resources that are already here the mighty rivers, the western winds on the west coast, uh, the tremendous geothermal resource on the North Island. Uh, I would like to think the solar resource in the Otago Highlands, there's tremendous natural resource. So closing the gap from what is today 70 or 80% to 100, New Zealand should be the leading country in the world with regard to renewable energy. It's not far away. A last piece of that is the electrification of vehicles. Imagine that you've displaced all the fossil fuels we burn in our vehicles today with the power of the rivers, the power of the wind, the power of the sun, the power of, that lies beneath us in the earth. Thank you. Uh, I would uh, welcome any questions and, and follow up. It's, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you.